If we're going to decide between Lord Helix and the Dark Lord Dome, we need to do some rigorous testing. I've poured my time into beating Pokemon Yellow three times with each of these fossilized memes. The editing on this project has also been a colossal task, so I honestly don't even have time to write a funny intro. Here are the challenge rules. I'll choose the Dome Fossil. I won't choose the Helix Fossil. The Dome Fossil is the best, I'll hail the Dark Lord. Don't worry everyone, I'll always make time for jokes, especially the repeating gags, mill tank puns, and cringy humor. Uh, as well as this guy. First, let's review our challengers for today's video. Both of these Pokemon are meme-worthy for reasons. Look at Kabutops. It has scythes for hands. Well, arms too, like, like the arms are sort of part of the hands. Like they turn into the hands, like the, the, the scythe hands, but it's really not a typical kind of like wrist, like a human wrist. It's sort of like a pivot point, it's much more mechanical. Uh, anyways, it's, uh, it's very cool. Going head to head with this killing machine is Omastar. It's definitely a worthy challenger. Twitch Plays Pokemon elevated this happy little prehistoric snail to god status. By the way, look at his art. His adorable little tentacles just really want some high fives. Look at him, you can't leave him hanging. But we might have to if he ends up losing today. Only winners get high fives. Which might become very dangerous if Kabutops wins. The structure of this video is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to race these two evolutionary lines, starting with their initial forms. Second, I'm going to race them, starting with their fully evolved forms. And finally, I'm going to do a race between their fully evolved forms again, but apply the lessons and optimizations I've learned along the way. This is going to be an ultra marathon, and if you've clicked on this video, you probably already know that. To make things more convenient for all of you, I've left time codes in the description so that you can return at different times to complete different sections of the video. Now, let's review our Pokemon's in-game potential. The learn sets tell an interesting story. It's very clear that Omanyte has a massive advantage against Brock. Its stab water gun is really going to make things easier. Kabuto, on the other hand, doesn't have much going for it. Brock is going to delay it a lot right out of the gate. Later on, it gets Slash. Additionally, it gets the overpowered Swords Dance, which I'm hoping will allow it to regain some ground and stay competitive. The distinct lack of stab rock moves on both of their movesets complicates the matter though, because Kabutops is a physical attacker, and Omastar is a special attacker, so clearly Omastar has an advantage from a design perspective. If we review the Evolved Forms learn sets for the second and third race, a couple of things become immediately clear. The game is going to be much easier for Kabutops because it has early access to Absorb. This is the main reason that I actually chose to do the video in this format, because honestly, things look really grim for Kabutops when it starts as Kabuto. But if they both start evolved, things might be much closer. The prediction that I made before I started these playthroughs is that Omastar is going to snail run circles around Kabutops. It has the early game advantage in the first race, and Incredible Special, which will help it throughout the entire playthrough. Stab Surf is just going to be so strong. I think Kabutops here is the Dark Horse. Uh, well, the Dark Lord, I mean. If there's any chance for the scythe-handed trilobite, Swords Dance is obviously it. Today's playthrough rules are simple. The Pokemon who beats the game with the fastest time wins one point. There are three races taking place, so there's a total of three points up for grabs. I'll only use either the Kabutops line or the Omastar line in battle. I won't use any items in battle, with the exception of catching a flying Pokemon and I won't use any glitches or exploits, also with one exception, which is that I will use the badge boost glitch under three scenarios. If it's triggered by an opponent's Pokemon, if the move that triggers it would make sense in a modern Pokemon game, and finally, if the Pokemon obviously has no chance of staying remotely competitive without it. I'm curious, before you watch, where do you think the hardest spots are gonna be? I read all the comments and I actually really want to know what people predict. First, I uh, need to start by discussing some incredibly serious criticism that I got on my Magmar vs. Electabuzz video. And that was that Magmar got a significant lead because her nickname was two characters shorter than Electabuzz's. The time it takes me to enter those extra characters are certainly a massive disadvantage. So today I worked out this perfectly. I really thought about this a lot. Each Pokemon will get eight characters total. Two capitalized letters, with the rest being lowercase. 
And you might say, but Scott, why not just avoid nicknames altogether and save the maximum possible amount of time? Well, these names just have such important memeing, so I really can't leave them out. As the fossils are rock water types, they will match up really well against the rival when he chooses Flareon. He evolves his EV based on the outcome of the first two fights before Brock. So to get the rival to pick Flareon, I'm going to need to win the first fight in the lab and then skip the second fight. So in this first race, I'm going to go easy on these two and have him pick Flareon. Later on, we are going to go up against Jolteon though, don't worry. Up next, Kabuto has a serious issue on its hands. I, I mean, small baby scythe hands. Brock is going to be extremely hard to deal with. And considering the early game moves that we have access to, uh, this is not going to be good. Kabuto doesn't learn any new moves until level 32. From a game design point of view, that makes sense. You're meant to revive it at level 30, so there's no big issue there. However, in this scenario, where I start with a level 5 Kabuto, the Dark Lord is just going to have to make this fight work with only Scratch and Harden. Brock only has normal type moves in this generation though, so Kabuto's rock typing is going to minimize damage taken. The setup of a few turns of Harden can also help minimize damage if I'm taking too much against the Geodude. And it can also help avoid damage entirely when Brock's Onyx is using Bide. I will need to be able to knock out both Pokemon with just the PP from scratch, so I'm going to need to be doing more than one hit point of damage each turn. I think this might be possible in the early teen levels if Kabuto gets a few critical hits or is managing to deal more than one damage at a time to Onyx. At level 14 I try Brock for the first time. Turn 1 I use Harden to ensure that he's only going to deal one damage each turn. Geodude's first attack only does one, so we're good to go. That means it's time for Scratch. It appears to be doing two damage at this level as well, which is really encouraging. After a tedious battle, Kabuto knocks the Geodude out and moves on to the rock hard snake, Onyx. Looks like Scratch is only dealing one damage to it each turn though. That means critical hits are going to be the only ticket to victory at this level. I use Harden every time that Onyx goes for Bide, and then continue scratching after it unleashes energy. Now pay some serious attention to this. Somehow, someway, Little Kabuto withstands all of Onyx's damage and brings it down to red health. I only have 3 PP left though. If I manage to critical hit at least once, I might be able to get this done with struggle. Unfortunately, I still have a lot of PP left on Harden, and I can only take 9 more damage. My second last scratch gets a critical hit, which takes Onyx into what looks like 2 hit range. One scratch and one struggle, or one critical hit. But I don't get it, and so it's time to spam Harden 15 times. Kabuto and I are dedicated to this fight. Right as I use my final PP of Harden, Onyx lands a hit, and it knocks me out. So that cost a lot of time, but there was actually a possibility of winning. At level 15 with slightly higher hit points, this will be possible. To gain this level, I fight the Lightyear's junior trainer in the gym, and then head back to the forest to train up a bit more. At level 15, Kabuto takes only one damage from Geodude without Harden. It might have been that way before anyways, but I didn't check. I knock it out easily and go into the Onyx fight with 6 more hit points than the previous fight. If I get similar luck, I will be able to win this. But this time, it isn't even close. Kabuto is a hard worker, because it's rock type. It puts in the hours and slowly whittles down the massive snake until it faints. Funny enough, on the turn that I thought I was going to knock it out, Kabuto got a generation 1 miss. It's a good thing that I leveled up so that this fight wasn't close. It would have been devastating to get that miss at level 14. Kabuto clocks in at a time of 19 minutes and 25 seconds. Almanite is going to have no issues with the early game. I'm going to attempt Brock as soon as I can. He opens with Geodude, and Almanite completely destroys it with a single water gun. Onyx is next. And it's the same story, as it faints to a single water gun. With that, Almanite clocks in with a fast time of 5 minutes and 30 seconds. Lord Helix has taken an extremely large lead. Snail's pace wins the race, I guess. On the next route, I start to realize some of the drawbacks of this meme snail. It has slow speed and gets hit by most Pokemon. For example, this Ekans outspeeds and poisons us. After that, it locks us in wrap. This combination of poison damage and wrap is absolutely brutal, 
and it knocks Omanyte out. Leveling up slightly more in the forest could have prevented this loss. On the second fight against him, I take the victory because the AI chooses terrible moves, and it just fails to poison Omanyte. In Mount Moon, I do battle with the Super Nerd. I need to win this one in order to be able to make the most important choice of the entire playthrough. After he's out of the way, I choose the... Helix Fossil. This will likely be the last video in which I make this choice. If you want to help me on the path to my dream of being a full-time Poketuber, spam Helix Fossil in the comments. It really helps with the algorithm. I'm underleveled for the rival, but because he has normal moves, I can make it through with ease. This is when the rock typing is going to start to wear out its welcome. It's been nice resisting all the early game normal moves. However, these fossils don't learn any rock type moves, and so it's really going to become a liability quickly. I mean, really quickly. On Nugget Bridge, I use potions as much as possible to prevent trips to the Pokemon Center. The Mankey Trainer just before the end of the bridge used Low Kick on Omanyte, and it actually knocks us out. So that's the first moment that the rock typing has sabotaged our time. On the second fight, I take care of him without incident. However, just before Bill's house, I have to battle the lass with two Oddishes. Water Gun does almost nothing. She hits Omanyte with Absorb, and this is clearly not going to be possible. I reset and teach Omanyte Bide in hopes that it might work better. But it won't work either just because there's two Oddishes, not one. Let's switch and start taking care of Misty first. Since her Pokemon all resist my moves because of their water typing, and my rock typing makes their water moves deal neutral damage, I am going to need to train first before this instead of wasting time on failed attempts. I fight the rest of the trainers in this portion of the game to level up. At level 23, I take Misty on for the first time. Water Gun just isn't doing the damage I need to get past Starmie. It immediately knocks Omnite out with a water move. So let's review the situation. I can't defeat Misty, which means I can't learn Bubble Beam. I can't go back to Mount Moon to train, because I can't go back up the ledge. I can't defeat the Lass, which means I can't head to the SSN. You have to save Bill from his strange Pokemon experiment in order to progress to Vermilion. The only option left is to train against wild Pokemon. I chose this route because it doesn't have any wild Oddish. I can't knock those out and they drain my health quickly with 4 times effective absorbs. So I can just turn my brain off here and grind. At level 25, I'm ready to attempt and see if things are better. Misty is still a big nope. What about the lass? Also a nope. What about at level 27? Still a nope for both of them. I really hope this isn't going to require level 34 when I learn a new move. At level 29, I attempt Misty again. This is my fourth fight against her. I've really been trying hard to save as much time as possible and not continuously make attempts if victory isn't clearly a possible outcome. At this level, I almost knock out the Starmie with Bide. Yeah, I'm trying Bide strategies here. There's really nothing else that I can do. On my second fight against her, Misty uses an X Defend on Starmie first turn. That means that I didn't take any damage before starting my Bide. It was so tense here. I really need to survive and then one-shot it. Almanite unleashes energy, and using all the rage he feels every time I choose the Dome Fossil in a run, he knocks Starmie out. That's a time of 46 minutes and 58 seconds. This is a surprising turn of events. I did not expect this section of the game to take this long. Misty is only half of the problem though. I still can't proceed to any new areas unless I defeat the lass as well. However, now I do have Bubble Beam, so this is going to help. Before I attempt her again, let's see how Kabuto does in this portion of the game. Kabuto fares much better on Route 3. This is largely because Scratch gives it greater PP, which reduces the frequency of Pokemon Center visits. I accidentally bumped into the optional Lass here, and this fight was really annoying. Jigglypuff disabled Scratch and then put me to sleep. After a little while, I wake up and the disable ends, and that allows me to knock it out. In Mount Moon, I get access to Water Gun, which is Kabuto's first stab move. I take care of the Super Nerd and grab the Dome Fossil. If you're on Team Dome and want to help with the algorithm, now is your time. Cheer on the Dark Horse. I mean, I mean the Dark Lord of this run. The rival on Nugget Bridge is next, but our rock typing makes him trivial. The issues in this section of the game are the Mankey Trainer, the Lass, and Misty. Mankey turns out to not be an issue, and that gives a small advantage to Kabuto. 
Next is the lass. Fingers crossed everyone. She sends out Oddish and Kabuto uses Scratch, and it deals half damage. Absorb does a lot of damage in return, so Oddish recovers a decent amount of health, taking it out of two hit range. It's not going to work at this level without some seriously lucky critical hits. For a consistent result, I think I'll need two or three more levels. I just need to be able to two-shot the Oddish after all. I arrived here at a higher level because of training for Brock, so this means that there are more trainers on this route to defeat for experience, so I can put off training in the wild. After reaching level 25, I return and face the lass again. Against Oddish, I use Scratch, and this time it does more than half damage. Oddish heals itself with a critical hit absorb. Okay, that did uh, way more than I would have liked. Next turn, without a critical hit, Kabuto does manage to knock the Oddish out. Pidgey is easy with two turns of Water Gun. And then the second Oddish is next. This time it doesn't land a critical hit absorb, and I take it down in two easy turns. This was way easier with Kabuto. It's a combination of being overleveled from Brock and the fact that I know a normal move. Because Misty might be challenging with only Scratch and Water Gun, I'm gonna go get Body Slam first. Leveraging my higher attack stat with a powerful normal move just makes more sense. I teach Charmander Dig, I grab the Bike Voucher, stock up on Repels, and then grab Body Slam. This makes the rival fight on the SSN simple. I get back to Misty, and I'm hopeful that this is gonna go well with Body Slam on my side. She opens with Staryu, and it doesn't have strong defense. Body Slam knocks it out in a single turn. Starmie is next. I'm very worried about Bubble Beam. However, it uses Water Gun first turn, and that takes Kabuto down to 41 hit points. I did stay within green health. My Body Slam lands, and it paralyzes Starmie. This lets Kabuto outspeed it and knock it out the next turn. This run clocks in with a time of 42 minutes and 46 seconds. Next is Surge. I pause the timer for the trash can puzzle. Once it's finished, I resume the timer when I'm standing next to Surge. First he uses Mega Punch, and Kabuto tanks it very well due to its rock typing. I land Body Slam, and it does more damage than I was expecting. Second turn, I hit Raichu, and Kabuto paralyzes it. Alright, I might outspeed now. I do, and I take it down. A 3 hit knockout and a first attempt victory. Kabuto gets a time of 44 minutes and 29 seconds. Now let's go back and check in with our good friend Almanite. Bubble Beam's higher power does serious damage to the lass's Oddish, and allows Almanite to get past her in its first try with this more powerful move. Finally, Lord Helix is free from this infuriating section of the game. So uh, the worst part of this is not over yet, uh, it's not. I, uh, I get the SS ticket and I head to Vermilion. I pick up items and learn Body Slam. So far so good. Then I smash the rival on the SSN. I'm overleveled now because of the previous segment of the game. And then my brain breaks. I exit the SSN and head towards Rock Tunnel immediately. I have no idea why I forgot Surge. But I did. Guess how long it took me to realize this. You think I realize in Rock Tunnel? Nope. I can't get by the final lass here because I am paralyzed and I have to dig out and heal up. After this playthrough, I've actually started buying Paralyze heals, uh, which you may have noticed in my other videos. So, did I remember Surge once I got to Celadon? Nope. I just went about my business, grabbed Ice Beam for Erika and then a fresh water for the Saffron Guards. Then I grabbed Fly. When I tried to use it to get back to Celadon's center, I realized that I don't have Surge's badge. At this moment, I actually stopped playing for a second and just thought like, do I have to do all of this again? Almanite beating Misty was so painful and the last, I, I just don't want to have to do that again. So I used another save file and actually calculated the time between the Fly Girl's house and Surge's gym. Uh, luckily, this mistake doesn't actually add much time to the clock. If I simply walk back through Saffron, the total time added to this run is about 30 seconds. However, it actually might have been a good strategy to do this anyways, because Almanite now is at a higher level, and that's going to make Surge actually much easier. Back in Celadon, the rocket hideout is easy for Almanite to get through. Giovanni is a joke, and with that, I'm ready to take on Erica. Ice Beam is required here. Her grass moves are going to be four times super effective, and I'm going to need one hits if I have any chance for victory. In the first fight against her, I get a critical hit and knock Tangela out. Weepin' Bell is less bulky, but it survives, and that means that I just really can't do this fight at this level. To train up, I finish off all the trainers in her gym. They're at lower levels, and I have Ice Beam, so this isn't risky at all. 
After this, I face Erica again, and at a higher level, without a critical hit, I can't knock the Tangela out. It uses Mega Drain, and that's it. So, Pokemon Tower is next. The rival fight, as well as the mandatory Chandler in here, give Omanyte the experience it needs in order to evolve into Omastar. The stat boost that comes with evolution is likely going to make Erica manageable now. Tangela is first. I outspeed it at snail's pace, and use Ice Beam, and it knocks it out. Since it's her bulkiest Pokemon, the rest of her team are going to be easy to knock out with a single Ice Beam. And after all of that's taken care of, Omastar clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 55 seconds. For Kabuto, Rock Tunnel is next as well. By the final last of the cave, it's clear that Kabuto is also going to have to dig out and redo this segment. That's okay though, because Almanite was forced to do the same thing due to paralysis. The game right now is just deciding that things need to be fair. So here's the first fight against Erika. It's really bad. Kabuto's low special stat causes two issues. We can't knock the Tangela out, and then when it uses Mega Drain, it knocks us out because it's four times effective and a special attack. Rip my water rock typing. Because of my lower special, I'm obviously going to need to evolve to defeat her. I attempt training in the gym like Omanyte did, but this isn't going to happen. I can't even one-hit the lower level grass Pokemon with Ice Beam. This trainer's Weepin' Bell paralyzes me and then traps me in wrap for so long. After I finally knock it out, Gloom comes out and then lands a massive hit, so I'm forced to reset. So there is a misplay to compensate for skipping Surge with Omanyte. Kabuto's abilities to train in this segment of the game are limited. The grass trainers in Erika's gym we've already talked about. Then to the west of Celadon there's a bunch of cue balls and cyclists, and they tend to have fighting types that know low kick. This means I'll need to fly back to the center a lot or purchase potions if I'm going to face them. There's also the fighting dojo, which I actually complete without too many issues, but the entire time I was just terrified of a critical hit low kick landing. The best place to train though is clearly Route 8 and Route 10, which are adjacent to Lavender Town. During my training I learned Slash at level 39, and with Kabuto's base speed of 55, this move has a critical hit chance of roughly 86%. So that's pretty good, but in one level I'll evolve into Kabutops, and it has scythes for hands, and a base speed of 80, giving it nearly a guaranteed critical hit with Slash. By the way, there is always a 1 in 256 chance that a critical hit doesn't occur, so it's never 100% but it's as close as it could be for Kabutops. Oh Gen 1, you buggy mess, I love you so much. Tangela has 100 base special and 115 base defense. I think here Ice Beam is going to be slightly better. I use Ice Beam as planned and it doesn't knock out the beefy vine monster with silly shoes. But it does freeze it, and that's all I needed. Next is Weepin' Bell. Slash gets the job done in a single hit. Finally, we made it to Gloom and it has higher base defense than Weepin' Bell. However, Slash also gets it done here, so we clock in with a time of 1 hour, 10 minutes, and 23 seconds. So how do these two Pokemon stack up after the first four gyms? Well, Almanite got a 13 minute and 55 second lead from Brock. When I first looked at the moveset, I figured that this was going to be it. Lord Helix would just take the victory because of the first gym leader. But I forgot that the last before Bill's house exists. This trainer alone set Omanyte back 4 minutes and 12 seconds when compared to Kabuto's time. After Erika, we have Kabutops in the lead by 5 minutes and 32 seconds. I'd say the reason for the increased time here between Misty and Erika is that Omanyte felt like it could defeat Erika, so I tried the fight a few more times on a lower level. Whereas with Kabutops due to my special stat, it was clear that I couldn't get it done without evolving, so I just went and trained right away. It appears that Snail's Pace is currently not winning the race. Omastar might not get its high fives after all. That would be a dark day. I complete the Safari Zone next. This gives both fossils access to Stab Surf. Generation 1 is obviously pre-physical special split, so all water moves are special. That means that Omastar is going to benefit from this move a lot more than Kabutops will. I teach it to our high-fiving meme lord right away. In Koga's gym, I test Omastar's surfs against psychic Pokemon. It's doing better than I expected, but I still expect Sabrina to be a bit tough because of how slow this snail is. Koga opens with Venonat. The bug poison type is honestly annoying. It's a high level and it knows some really frustrating status moves. It puts me to sleep after surviving a surf with a sliver of health. Good thing Omastar's special allows it to tank the psychics really well. 
Unfortunately, I do end up staying asleep far too long, and then the fight ends. Just because of how well I'm tanking the Psychics, I want to give it a try again. This time, the first Venonat gets knocked out in a single hit, so that means it's a range. The second Venonat survives, but misses, and then the third one misses too. On to Venomoth with nearly full health. This Psychic Dragon type is really intimidating. I'm always scared for its stab six times effective Psychics. However, Omastar is actually a true meme, and it manages to take the Venomoth down. In the battle of the memes, the snail wins. This means that it clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 22 minutes, and 15 seconds. After that, I complete Sylph. I grab a hidden elixir, the card key, and a rare candy. Omastar can't learn either Sword Stance or Earthquake, so I skip those TMs. During this playthrough, I've also found a more efficient route through this place. I could also probably start taking the elevator to the floor with the card key as one final improvement. I won't do that in these runs though so that Kabutops doesn't get a small advantage. The rival, who is also a meme, opens with Sand Slash. Surf makes this easy, then Cloyster comes out, and I genuinely wasn't sure what to do here. Water resists water and Cloyster has 180 base defense. I tried Body Slam, but it turns out that I should have just relied on Omastar's special stat. I switch into Surf to knock it out. Magneton is next. This one might be an issue in the league, but here a neutrally effective Surf gets the job done. I accidentally used Surf against Kadabra because this is when I was spamming A instead of B, but that puts it in potion range so I can just knock it out next turn anyways. Flareon comes out last and it's a simple one hit. There's only one challenging gym left, Sabrina. She opens with Abra, and right away I realize that this isn't going to be fun. Things are never fun with Sabrina around. In this case, her Pokemon outspeed the meme, Kadabra gets a special drop with Psychic, and then knocks me out on the next turn. I decided to train and come back a few levels higher, but since I'm reviewing and editing this script over a month after this footage was taken, it would have obviously just been better to do Blaine first and get the special boost that his badge confers. In the second fight against Sabrina, Abra misses its flash. Kadabra lands Psychic, dealing one-third damage to Omastar. However, second turn it misses a Psy Wave, and I knock it out. Alakazam is last. It uses a turn one recover, and Body Slam paralyzes it. I was a bit worried here that I still wouldn't outspeed because, after all, Meme Lord is a prehistoric snail, but I do, and Alakazam faints. From here the road is easier. As I make my way through Pokemon Mansion, I reflect on my experience with Omastar as a kid. My Butterfree just wasn't up to the task that is Blaine, but a low level Omanyte had no problem once you teach it Surf. The water rock typing is so good at one thing, defeating fire types, and Blaine's team specifically. You take half damage from his powerful physical attacks and one quarter damage from his fire moves. As a kid, I'll never forget the animation of Surf and how great it made me feel knocking Blaine out for the first time. Giovanni is similar. Dugtrio lands a brutal dig because it outspeeds the meme snail, but I knock it out with Surf in one hit. Persian goes down in a single hit as well. Luckily, Double Team didn't make me miss. Then Nidoqueen gets outspeed by a snail, and I knock it out. Unfortunately though, Nidoking outspeeds us and goes for Thunder, but it misses and I knock it out with Surf. Right on his last. Luckily though, this meme snail is way faster than this rock dinosaur, and I outspeed it and knock it out with a 4 times effective surf. The gym challenge is complete with a time of 1 hour, 35 minutes, and 41 seconds. Now, let's see how Kabutops will do with this portion of the game. In Fuchsia City, was anyone else really annoyed by the placement of this mart? It's in the strangest place. It's in the middle of a Pokemon zoo. I strongly dislike walking over here. This is the first time that I've actually done this in one of these playthroughs. In Koga's gym, the psychic trainers are easy because I have critical hit slashes. Koga opens with Venonat. It survives my attack and puts me to sleep. After that, it spams Psychic and knocks Kabutops out. Lower special is the issue here. I'm really not tanking as much damage as Omastar was. I tried this fight one more time, and for me at the time of recording, that confirmed that I needed to train. Sylph is the best place to do this right now. I grab the items I mentioned in the Omastar section, and then proceed to a trainer that is a meme in the Pokemon playthrough community. This fight scares me. Sand Slash is an easy one hit, but Cloyster isn't. I won't have anything that's particularly strong against this bulky water ice type. 
Luckily for me, it spams withdraw, and that allows me to knock it out. Critical hits bypass stat changes after all, so I'm really good against withdraw. Magneton lands a brutal thundershock. This is why I think the champion fight is going to be so bad. Sandslash takes it out, and then Kadabra and Flareon all in one hit. So I'm reading this script a month later, and you're watching this video probably a month and a half after I filmed the footage, and you're probably asking the questions that I'm asking. Why no surf? Why no swords dance? To answer the first question, I don't like getting locked into HM moves early on in Generation 1. Especially here because Kabutops has low special. To answer the second question, I honestly just forgot about swords dance during this playthrough. Uh, don't worry though, I do remember it, just not right now. I level up a bit and at level 50 the Dark Lord is able to use his scythe hands to one shot all the Venonats and two hit the Venomoth. That felt much easier. Kabutops clocks in at a time of 1 hour, 28 minutes, and 6 seconds. Sabrina is going to be easier with Kabutops. I can outspeed her Pokemon, and my higher attack stat allows Kabutops to knock them out in a single hit. She uses an X Defend on Alakazam, which is completely negated by the critical hit from my Slash. 1 hour, 29 minutes, and 30 seconds is Kabutops' completion time. I surf across the sea, complete Pokemon Mansion, and then face Blaine. I'm at a higher level than Omastar was, but my Surf is dealing less damage due to my special stat. Still though, because my typing, this fight is so easy. So Giovanni's next. Dugtrio and Persian aren't issues, but the Nidos really are. They know Thunder, Double Kick, and Earthquake. All of these moves can deal massive damage to Kabutops. Of them, Double Kick is easiest to tank because it's a low power move. However, it is super effective and often lands critical hits. Earthquake is second. It's super effective and a high base power move, but the worst is Thunder due to the base power being the highest. Funny enough, in these fights, he doesn't even use Thunder and I still can't do it. I train up in his gym and return at level 54. Nidoqueen is not a one-shot at this level, but this time it uses Double Kick instead of Earthquake. So far, so good. Giovanni uses a guard spec on Nidoking, and with that, Kabutops is moving on to the final rival fight with a time of 1 hour, 37 minutes, and 47 seconds. Yep, so no mention of Swords Dance in there. Also, I think that Earthquake is probably scarier just because of the Nidos' lower special stat than attack stat. It's really a good thing that I am doing three attempts at these. With Omastar, the fight against the final rival is so close. This is due to the fact that Magneton gets a Thunder Wave off. Then, Kadabra lands a critical hit Psybeam, taking Omastar down to two hit points. Flareon is last, and if it attacks, I'm finished. However, it goes for Leer, and I knock it out. That was really lucky. There is only a 40 second gap between these two Pokemon. I can't believe that after all this, they are this close. I was so sure that Omanyte was going to win this run just because of Brock. Then when it got walled by the Oddish Lass, I thought it would go the other way for sure. But Omastar has now caught back up because of its special stat, and has taken a tiny advantage. So Snail Pace might end up winning the race at the end of the day. So who's going to win the first race between the fossils? My head says the high-fiving meme Omastar, however my heart says the scythe-handed Dark Lord Kabutops. Perhaps if it does a little jig with its swords, it might just surprise us. Omastar against Lorelei is not a fun time. He might want high fives, but he isn't getting any yet. The rock typing means her water moves are dealing neutral damage. The worst offender here is Clamp, which Cloyster seems to like almost always use. It's immediately clear that I can't deal enough damage and that I'm going to need rest and to take this fight slow. This move isn't enough alone though. I also need to teach Omastar Toxic in order to improve my abilities to stall. I can get to Lapras with this strategy, but Hydro Pump deals a lot of damage to me. After 5 consecutive losses with this strategy, I use my first 3 rare candies and then continue. Sometimes Lapras gets lucky too, and gets a critical hit with Hydro Pump, which knocks Omastar out. On the next fight, I'm able to get back to Lapras, I use Toxic, and then Lapras misses. Not once, but twice. This gives me what I need. I heal with rest, and the poison does its job. Okay, alright, fine Omastar, you can have a high five. You did manage to beat Lorelei. Let's move on. Bruno is easy. Gotta save time in the script somewhere, right? Agatha is next, and this is scary for Omastar. 
the first Gengar knows Mega Drain, which is a serious problem, especially because our speed is, well, snail pace. What this fight really comes down to is avoiding Mega Drain and then avoiding Hypnosis. I can use Rest against the Golbat and the Arbok, but I need to refrain from using it against the Ghosts to prevent Mega Drain or Dream Eater. In the first fight, Gengar puts me to sleep and eats my dreams until Omastar faints. In the second, she lands a massive turn 1 Mega Drain. It would have obviously been worse if I had already damaged her, I guess. Golbet gives me an opportunity to heal. After it's out of the way, Haunter uses Hypnosis and puts Omastar to sleep. Great. This is gonna be bad, isn't it? Well, nope. It actually just spams other moves and forgets that it has Dream Eater. I wake up and then I knock it out. Arbok isn't hard to deal with, but healing here can be rough because Screech makes the final Gengar's Confuse Ray deadly. The last Gengar is weird. It comes out and just sort of faints, like it takes so many turns for us to knock it out, but it just goes down, doesn't really do anything to us. Alright, time for Lance. I teach Omastar Blizzard before this fight. I'll need it against at least the Dragonite, but it will also help against the Gyarados. First fight, Gyarados lands a critical hit with Hydro Pump. The momentum from that hit allows it to knock Omastar out a few turns later with another critical hit. Fight number two, he doesn't get a crit, and this time I'm able to move on to the Dragonairs. I go for a turn one Surf to test the waters, but I should have definitely used Blizzard instead. This forces me to heal up, and the Dragonair gets a critical hit Thunderbolt, which knocks me out. Okay, don't use water moves against dragons when they resist them. Third fight might be the charm, right? This time, I get bad luck with Blizzard. It misses, and Gyarados lands a Hydro Pump. On the third turn, it looks like it's all over. Gyarados lands another Hydro Pump, and Omastar survives with four hit points. I take the Gyarados out and heal up on the next Dragonair. It misses twice, lands a Thunderbolt, and then I knock it out with Blizzard. Only one PP of Blizzard left for Dragonite. Against Aerodactyl, I take my time and heal up. I'd rather not rush this. When I wake up, I use Surf and KO it immediately, and Dragonite is next. I use Blizzard, and the Snail outspeeds the Dragon, and I knock it out. Omastar finishes the Elite Four with a time of 2 hours, 2 minutes, and 40 seconds. Against Lorelei, I try Kabutops out with its current moveset. Slash is dealing good damage, but I'm just too frail. By the time I reach Lapras, I've got almost no health left. I attempted this fight two more times with this moveset, and it's just not happening. I really should have just taught Kabutops Swords Dance right away. First turn, I need to attack Dugong. This will make it go to sleep on the second turn if it selects Rest. This gives me the opportunity to set up Swords Dance and get plus 6 attack. Dugong wakes up, but I outspeed it with Body Slam. But it gets a critical hit, so that negates all my setup, allowing Dugong to survive and hit me with Bubble Beam. The text that displays here says it's not very effective, and this is a glitch. It's actually neutrally effective. The game chooses this text from a list, so it's determining that water moves are not very effective against water moves, without considering how rock typing plays into the calculation. Swords Dance has allowed me to sweep through all of her Pokemon, and now I'm at her ace Lapras. I use Body Slam, and I get another critical hit. I think I'll survive Hydro Pump because of the badge boost, though. I do, and then I knock Lapras out. Bruno is Bruno, let's save time in the script. Agatha sends out Gengar first. The unfortunate thing about this fight is that I don't have any super effective moves. Mimic can't steal anything useful either, so Surf is the best strategy here. On my first fight, I faint on Arbok because of damage from Toxic. The second fight I get paralyzed by the initial Gengar. This is one of the best things that can happen against Agatha, now she is unable to put me to sleep and use Dream Eater. Her offensive moves are now Wing Attack, Leech Life, Acid, Lick, Psychic, and Mega Drain. Of those, Psychic and Mega Drain are the only two that I'm worried about. In this fight, the final Gengar does finish me off with Psychic though. Third attempt time. Here I get confused right away, and then Gengar paralyzes me. Part nuisance, part gift I guess. Luckily, I snap out of confusion without damaging myself. Against Haunter, things take a turn for the worse. I'm paralyzed and I miss so many attacks, and then it confuses me. After that, she switches into Arbok. Together, these two tag-team me down to 64 health. Not a good place to be against the final Gengar. It confuses me my first turn. I land Surf, 
and then it uses Dream Eater while I'm awake. It would have been really nice if the AI was given a script to prevent that sort of move selection. So Kabutops defeated Agatha. Lance is last. I'm terrified for this fight. Gyarados has Hydro Pump, the first Dragonair has Thunderbolt, and the second Dragonair has Bubble Beam. My strategy is simple. Set up Swords Dance against Gyarados once, then sweep until Aerodactyl, where I can finish my setup. Can the Dark Lord do it? I tank the first Hydro Pump well and remain in green health, and then I land Body Slam. It doesn't KO, but it paralyzes and prevents Gyarados from attacking again. Both the Dragonair are easy one hits with Body Slam. Against Aerodactyl, I set up two more times before knocking it out. Dragonite is last. Kabutops has had such a good time dancing, so now it's time for some dragon hunting. It lands Body Slam and Dragonite faints. I defeated Lance on my first attempt. Kabutops gets a time of 1 hour, 53 minutes, and 49 seconds. It's now 8 minutes and 51 seconds ahead of Omastar. The stall tactics have really put the living meme behind. For Omastar, the champion starts off with an easy one hit on Sandslash. After that, it takes two turns to knock out the Alakazam. Executor is next, and it gets frozen by my Blizzard. This allows me to heal up and knock it out, moving on to the Magneton. Stab Surf doesn't knock it out, and then it paralyzes me. Great, this is uh, really not what I needed. A couple turns of bad luck, and it knocks the Meme Snail out. Okay, I'll try again. Second fight, everything plays out nearly the same as it did before. This time, Executor misses rather than getting frozen. But either way, I make it to the Magneton with full health. It uses Thunderbolt first turn. I survive and knock it out. Cloyster is next, and Clamp is going to be annoying. For some reason, I kept using Body Slam here. At this point in the filming process, I had been playing and scripting for about 6 hours, so I was tired and I wasn't thinking very well. Surf would have obviously been better. Cloyster has incredible defense and I have poor attack. Additionally, Surf gets stab. Flareon is last. Incredibly, it actually survives a Surf, but then it just faints the next turn. Omastar did it. It gets a time of 2 hours, 5 minutes, and 42 seconds. Now, can the champion stop the Dark Lord? When I was filming this, I had the amazing idea of mimicking Earthquake. Uh, because it'll be really good against Magneton and Alakazam. I also learnt Blizzard for this fight, which I thought would help against Executor. Honestly, what was I thinking? This is a terrible idea. The damage that I take from Sandslash's Earthquake is going to make stealing the move not worth it at all. I pay the price and lose the first fight against Butt. The second fight I adapt. I knock out Sandslash with Surf, preventing damage. Then I use Body Slam against Alakazam. It survives, but gets paralyzed. On Executor, I can let Kabutops do his jig because it's going to spam Leech Seed because it thinks it's super effective. Funny enough, the Blizzard I use doesn't even KO the Executor. Uh, Kabutops has bad special. I should have just used Body Slam. After that, I move on to Magneton, and it's a one hit. Cloyster is next. I hit it with Body Slam, and I almost take it out. And then it uses Clamp, which deals a lot of damage to me. This move is really scary. Especially because if it crits, each successive hit will do the same amount of damage. However, Kabutops survives, and Flareon is last. Because I'm so set up, I use Body Slam, and I knock it out. Kabutops did it with a time of 1 hour, 57 minutes, and 21 seconds. So the victor of our first race is Kabutops. It takes the crown with an 8 minute and 21 second lead, despite my failure to use Swords Dance at an earlier time. This is really a great result. We are one step closer now to confirming that the dome fossil is, in fact, the superior fossil. Here are the factors that I think led to its victory. 1. Its ability to defeat the Oddish Lass with Scratch without needing to grind in the wild and overlevel. 2. Its high speed made Slash very effective in the mid-game and allowed it to outspeed most opponents. 3. Its ability to learn Swords Dance, which gave it the ability to dance around all of its opponents in the league. If you enjoyed the first playthrough, like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, comment, and share this video with a friend. If you want to go above and beyond in supporting me, consider joining my Patreon. There's a link in the description. It's time for the second race. This one, I'm starting with evolved forms of these Pokemon. 
Kabutops and Omastar both start with one additional move over their pre-evolutions. For Kabutops, it gets Absorb, and for Omastar, it gets Horn Attack. These two moves will help each of these Pokémon deal with the barrier they experienced in the previous playthrough. I'm also going to be using the lessons that I learned in the previous runs to influence my routing on these next runs. Kabutops thrives once it gets Swords Dance and Body Slam. I should teach this combo to it as early as possible. Omastar, on the other hand, thrives when it gets Surf, so I'll prioritize picking it up before completing the Rocket portion of the game. Also, both of these Pokémon struggle with Misty and Erica. I need to get Body Slam before the former, and Slash or Ice Beam for the latter. Alright, let's go. Last time these Pokémon had it easy, this time I'm going to make things a bit harder for them by having the final rival evolve Eevee into Jolteon. In the optional battle west of Viridian, Kabutops actually gets stuck in an awful fight. My attack is lowered many times, and once I finally knock the Spearow out, Eevee sets up the most powerful move in the world, Sand Attack. Because of my rock typing and absorb, I'm not actually going to get knocked out here, but it is a really tedious fight. I guess the game decided that Kabutops just isn't allowed to get past the early game without at least one frustratingly slow fight. In the forest, I defeat all the bug catchers. The Oddish Lass is coming up, and previously Kabuto was victorious because it was overleveled. So, no slacking on levels now. I don't want to get walled later. At level 11, Brock is easy. I can two-shot both of his Pokémon with Absorb and finish the fight with a time of 8 minutes and 44 seconds. Much easier this time. Omastar has better defense than Kabutops, and this allows it to breeze through the lab fight and skip the small amount of training that I did with Kabutops just before the optional rival fight. Because his Pokémon can't lower my special, I can spam Water Gun and knock them both out without incident. Omastar is off to a good start. In the forest, I face all the trainers, which brings me to level 11 before Brock. Stab Water Gun one-shots both of his Pokémon, and this run gets a time of 6 minutes and 44 seconds. Funny enough, that's slower than Ammonite's time, just because I did the extra training in the forest. In Mount Moon, I grab the Helix Fossil. Second last time. The rival on Nugget Bridge is a pushover with this meme snail on my side. After he's out of the way, I proceed without healing. Omastar has such a great PP reserve that I may be able to get through this route without healing at all. That turns to not quite work out though. I don't feel comfortable going into the last fight with this little PP. I head back, heal up, and now that my PP is replenished, I'm ready. Will it be revenge, or will this one be another nightmare? Let's find out. She opens with Oddish. This time I have Horn Attack on my side. It does good damage to Oddish, and then I tank and absorb. By the way, nice total amount of health Omastar. High five buddy. The Lass's second Oddish comes out, and I get a critical hit and that knocks it out in a single turn. Well, that was significantly easier than last time. This is actually the run where I thought of my regular dig strategy between Cerulean and Vermilion. Because I'm skipping Misty, I'd have to walk to Vermilion, get Body Slam, and then walk back to Cerulean, and then walk back to Vermilion after defeating Misty. That's a lot of walking. So I can instead use Charmander with Dig to prevent nearly all of this. I do get in an annoying fight with a sand attacking Pidgey, and this wastes my PP, so I do have to use an Aether. After grabbing the Bike Voucher, I proceed to the SSN without healing in Vermilion. After finishing the SSN, I walk to Diglett's Cave and dig back to Cerulean, saving the walk time. Actually, someone commented that I could dig out of the Bike Voucher guy's house, but this actually isn't the case in Pokemon Yellow. When I'm back in Cerulean, I grab the bike, stock up on Paralyze Heal, Antidote, and Repels for the cave. I'm not digging out of there this time. The reason I use this Mart specifically is because there are both Paralyze Heals and Antidotes in stock here. After all that's done, my body slamming, high fiving snail takes on Misty. While I don't one hit her Pokemon, I tank their attacks well and deal enough damage to get past her on my first attempt. This second section of the game was so much easier for Omastar. Surge's Raichu is the next challenge. This fight could be awful. I use Bubble Beam and I get a first turn Gen 1, 1 in 256 chance miss. Well, that's not fun. After that, he just spams the Mega Moves and uses X Speed until I knock him out with Bubble Beam. So, I got extremely unlucky on the first turn and then extremely lucky after that. 
I didn't heal in Vermilion again, so I can just dig back to Cerulean and shorten the walk time to Rock Tunnel. In here, the last causes a few issues for me. Her Oddish takes three hits, allowing it to paralyze me. After that, the Bulbasaur takes Omastar out. I did save right in front of her though, which allows me to quickly reattempt and defeat her on the second try. I skip healing in Lavender Town because I really want to heal in Celadon. This really matters. The Rocket Hideout gives us some extra experience that's helpful in prepping for Erika as well. I head back to Lavender Town and take care of Pokemon Tower right away. I'm doing all this now, so my level will be as high as possible when I first attempt Erika. I want to minimize failed attempts at all costs. Now I can wake up Snorlax, and I head to Fuchsia City immediately, where I skip the Pokemon Center and immediately grab Surf. The fact that I healed in Celadon now means that digging out of the Safari Zone teleports me back to Erika. I shouldn't delay any longer, so it's time to take her on. She opens with Tangela, and Ice Beam doesn't knock it out. Then it lands a critical hit with Vine Whip, and takes Omastar down to orange health. Well, that's really not a good start. Her less bulky Pokemon are next. Weepin' Bell comes out, and it gets one hit by Ice Beam. Gloom is last. It unfortunately survives and finishes me off with Petal Dance. To increase Omastar's level a few more times before I take her on again, I train up in her gym and the Fighting Dojo. Because I have Ice Beam and Surf, these places are really easy. At level 37, I can one-shot all of her Pokemon. I've done it. The hardest gym leader is no more. Omastar gets a time of 45 minutes and 29 seconds. With Kabutops, I grab Water Gun in Mount Moon. This is our first stab move, and it would be foolish to skip it. The additional PP is going to help on Nugget Bridge. I defeat the Super Nerd and make the correct choice. After that, it's time for Nugget Bridge, and my strategy here is the same as it was with Omastar. I want to use potions as much as possible and only travel back to heal if I absolutely need to. Different than Omastar though, Kabutops actually makes it through the entire bridge and arrives at the last with enough health and PP to fight her. Please don't let this fight make Kabutops uncompetitive. Please Dark Lord Dome, bless this fight. She opens with Oddish. I use Scratch and cross my fingers. But not actually, I've got to play the game and stay focused. It does more damage than Omastar did with Horn Attack. That's Kabutops' high attack stat for you. I finish off the Pidgey without issue. The second Oddish is the same as the first. After she's out of the way, I grab the Aether and proceed towards Vermilion without healing. I want to attempt the same dig strategy here that I used with Omastar. The rival in the SSN doesn't have a chance because of Body Slam and Bubble Beam. I obtain Cut and then dig back to Cerulean to face Misty. She opens with Staryu, which gets pummeled and easily knocked out by Body Slam. Starmie is next. It does outspeed, but I don't take too much damage from Water Gun. I damage it and do more than half. Okay, please no Bubble Beam. It uses Water Gun and gets a crit, but Kabutops survives and finishes the Starmie off. 25 minutes and 13 seconds. Surge is next. He sends out Raichu. Please no Thunderbolt. I want four of four victories against him on the first fight. He outspeeds and gets a critical hit with Mega Punch. Body Slam takes him to half health. Okay, no Thunderbolt, please. He uses X Speed and Kabutops knocks the Raichu out. I did it. Four of four attempts and I didn't get a Thunderbolt. That leaves me with a time of 26 minutes and 25 seconds for Kabutops. On my way to Rock Tunnel, I save before this last. She can actually be really tough if you're running a water Pokemon or if you have a particularly slow Pokemon. However, Kabutops deals with her very easily. I really didn't need to save there. The last in the tunnel is also much easier this time. Higher attack and higher speed stats allow Kabutops to quickly one-shot both of her grass-type Pokemon. I skip the Lavender Town Pokemon Center like I did with Omastar. In Celadon, the order changes up slightly. I get the items I need, and then I get unlucky. I try to catch a Spearow over here, but it breaks out of three Great Balls. That's the first time that's happened to me. I usually get it in one or two. And on most runs, I usually buy four to five balls, but this time I tried to cut a quarter and I really got punished. I have to head back to the department store and buy more before I can catch my flying Pokemon. I'll just buy five from now on. I'm usually having PP issues in these challenges, but this time it was the balls. I'm going to do the entire rocket plotline before attempting Erika. 
I want to get access to Swords Dance because setting up on Tangela will be possible. Sylph is where all this comes together. I teach Kabutops how to do a jig and then attempt the rival. He opens with Sandslash and Bubble Beam doesn't get the job done in one turn, and then he lowers my accuracy. After I take care of it, Ninetales comes out next. It can't deal much damage to me due to my typing. I take this opportunity to set up three sword stances. Do the jig, Kabutops. We know you love to dance. I don't think Kabutops smiles though when it dances, it just stares. Moving on to Cloyster, it deals a lot of damage with a four turn clamp. My following attack knocks it out though. Kadabra outspeeds and lands an attack, which knocks Kabutops out. Okay, I, I can do this. One more attempt before I head elsewhere. The fight opens the same way. Cloyster doesn't get a clamp off this time, and that allows me to tank Kadabra's attack and then knock it out. When Jolteon came out, I had one of those like, oh yeah, I really just forgot about that moments. It goes for double kick and takes Kabutops down to two hit points. I land Body Slam, which knocks it out. That fight was actually really close. At this point, I debated teaching Kabutops Ice Beam for Erika, but in the end, I decided against it because its special stat is not very high, and Erika's Pokemon are all centralized around special. I think that Body Slam with Swords Dance is going to be the way to go. I use one turn of Swords Dance to boost my attack in order to one-shot the Tangela. Its Mega Drain doesn't knock me out, and then I begin to sweep. Tangela down. Weepin' Bell down. Gloom down. Kabutops gets a time of 46 minutes and 57 seconds. This is the closest these two Pokemon have been together. There's only 1 minute and 28 seconds separating them. However, I think that Kabutops gained significant ground in this leg of the race, which isn't accounted for in the timer. It did complete Sylph, and Omastar hasn't done that yet. I think that the Safari Zone takes less time than Sylph overall. In Sylph, Omastar does make quick work of all the rockets. Its high special in combination with an insane defense stat really helps here. The scariest moment of this whole place is facing the rival's Jolteon. Lucky for me, Jolteon uses double kick for two turns and Omastar just barely survives, allowing it to attack three times in a row and knock the Jolteon out. This is likely going to be a problem later on. Koga is next. At level 43, Omastar can one-shot the first two of his Venonats. Unfortunately, the third one puts me to sleep, and over the course of my nap, I take far too much damage, so the Venomoth can just knock me out. In retrospect, I could have taught Omastar rest here, and that would have allowed me to get through this fight in a single attempt. I end up taking four to get this done, so that's not very efficient. I really thought that Omastar's high special would allow it to get through this a bit easier. However, Koga's status conditions really did make it hard. Hard as a shell made out of rock, that is. I surf across the sea and complete Pokemon Mansion. In Blaine's gym, I take the opportunity to train against all of the trainers here. I want to raise my level so that the league isn't too hard for Omastar. Blaine is simple. My typing makes this an obvious cakewalk. Next is my base arena. I get lucky here. Uh, yeah, I get lucky here because she uses Psywave twice on Kadabra. On Alakazam, she continues her obsession with Psywave, and I take her down to Orge Health. Alakazam heals with Recover, but it doesn't recover enough health. Omastar is victorious. Also, did you know that you can actually dig out of Sabrina's gym too? Sorry Bay, but Omastar is an impatient little snail. We really gotta get going. In the final gym, I spend some time leveling up so that I can learn Hydro Pump. Last time I skipped it because of its accuracy, and then I struggled against the Nidos. This time, I'll keep it around just to deal with them. His Dugtrio lands an Earthquake before I knock it out. Because of that, I go into the fight against Nidoqueen with Orge Health. It outspeeds and knocks me out with Thunder. Last time, I was outspeeding it, so I'll train up a few more levels in this gym. Hopefully that will make a difference. At level 51, I outspeed Nidoqueen and knock it out. Then Nidoking outspeeds me and uses Thunder. So that did nothing. Nidoking only has 75 base special in Generation 1, and my special is very high, so that's why I didn't do much. Hydro Pump lands, and I move on to Rhydon. It must be embarrassing being this intimidating, horn-drilling rock dinosaur thing and getting one hit by a water snail. 
With that, the meme prevails over the jam challenge with a time of 1 hour, 6 minutes, and 56 seconds. With Kabutops, I head south to Fuchsia for the first time. Because I did Sylph first, Koga is going to be possible at this level. I've got to set up on the first Venonat, and status conditions could be brutal here. But I wake up from sleep, and then I can sweep his entire team with Body Slam. Kabutops really feels great at this stage of the game. I love that it has decent speed and hits like a truck. Sabrina is next. I knock out Abra in one hit, but surprisingly Kadabra survives. Next is Alakazam, and it outspeeds setting up Reflect. Because critical hits bypass stat changes, I should have just started to use Slash here. I take the longer, riskier option and set up Swords Dance once before using Body Slam to knock the Alakazam out. I'll reason this misplay away with the logic that Kabutops just isn't happy winning a fight without doing his dance. So uh, Blaine loses, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Before Giovanni, I grab the TM for Mimic. I'm gonna use it against him. He opens with the trio and it uses Fissure and it lands. Get it? It lands because it's a, it's a ground move? Well, that rarely happens. On my second attempt, I Mimic Earthquake. This is going to give me a physical attack that is super effective against the majority of his Pokemon. Persian isn't a threat, so I can set up here with Swords Dance. Do your jig, Kabutops. After that, I sweep through his entire remaining team with ease. I've defeated the gym challenge with a time of 1 hour, 2 minutes, and 51 seconds. Kabutops is now ahead by 3 minutes and 54 seconds. I could have taught Surf earlier, which might have slightly extended this lead, but overall I'm happy with where the Dark Lord is at. The Rival is next, and Sandslash survives a hit because I've been stubborn about learning Surf. I really hate that there is no move deleter in this generation. Execute seems like a good place to set up because it's weak, but then it uses Solar Beam, so I just knock it out before I take damage. None of those four times effective grass damage moves for Kabutops. I finish setting up on the Ninetales and then sweep the rest of his team until Jolteon comes out. It outspeeds me and goes for Thunder Wave. Okay, I just need to land my attack. Kabutops lands its attack and knocks Jolteon out. So now let's see how Omastar deals with this rival. And unfortunately ahead for it are significant issues. The rival fight is going to be nearly impossible due to my snail speed. It'll allow Jolteon to always move first. Thunder is likely going to do massive damage. To make matters worse, I have some experience with this fight, and in the previous fight, I wouldn't have actually got past it if the Flareon's AI hadn't picked Leer. The Jolteon won't offer me any of these luxuries though. The second issue is that even if we do make it past the rival due to luck, the Elite Four requires stall tactics, which greatly slow Omastar's time. These tactics sometimes just fall apart due to a critical hit, as well as having to replay a fight costs Omastar more time than it costs Kabutops. I thought about this long and hard. I need a way to have Omastar remain competitive and not fall behind in this stage of the game. To solve these issues, I think the only way is to allow Omastar to get a bit dirty. The rival opens with Sandslash, and I take it out with Surf. Now it's time for double team. I should have set up on Sandslash, but I get 6 double teams off on Execute. I rest to cure my paralysis, and then it's time for the snail to sweep, and earn his high fives. Ice Beam knocks the seed egg thing out. Then I take down Ninetales with a Surf. I deal really good damage to the Cloister with a not very effective Surf, and then it misses Clamp. Next turn it faints, and then Kadabra comes out. It almost always tries to set up a Reflect in this fight, which is one reason I decided to replace Body Slam. My low attack and his Reflect makes Surf the better choice anyways. Jolteon is last. Double Team does what it was intended for, and Jolteon misses all of its attacks. That allows the Snail to march to victory. Honestly, I think the Double Team is pretty awful. Almost every Pokemon can learn it, and it just makes every run about luck. Will the AI hit you? Probably not, but if they do it might be really hard, and that's honestly not very fun for me to play, and it's not very fun for you to watch. But let me make a case for why it's a fair choice right now in this race. 1. Kabutops is already leading, and if the previous league attempt tells us anything, it's that Omastar won't be able to catch up by using those strategies again. I need to have a new approach. 2. 
Every time Kabutops sets up Sword Stance, it boosts a relevant stat and triggers the badge boost glitch. Omastar only has access to this glitch through Withdraw or Double Team. Withdraw doesn't boost relevant stats in the league, so I could use it, but I'd only get one portion of what Kabutops gets. So in order to give Omastar the badge boost glitch and raise a stat that helps in battle, I need to use Double Team. Third, I filmed some attempts at the final rival without Double Team, and because of this fight alone, Omastar loses tentacles down to Kabutops. I do just want to give this living meme a decent shot at victory. Moving forward though, in future versus videos, I won't be using Double Team anymore. So this is the last time we get to see these awesome dirty tactics at play. For Omastar, Dugong is a great opportunity to set up Double Team. In this case, I set up once and then damage it so that it'll fall asleep if it chooses rest on second turn. This is like a 9000 IQ move by the way because it uses rest second turn 80% of the time. Oh ho ho, I'm so smart. These next few turns allow me to get double team going. I want all six set up. I don't need Lapras ruining my day with a Hydro Pump. After that, I can start sweeping with Surf. I level up in the middle of this fight, which does reset all of my badge boost increases, but at least I have good evasion. I poison Lapras just in case I need to heal or I run out of PP with Surf. This new strategy allows Omastar to defeat Lorelei on its first attempt. Uh, next is Bruno, and uh, why would we talk about him? Maybe actually because Hitmonlee knows high jump kick. I luckily avoid it, and that would have been really bad if it had hit me. The scariest thing in this fight is Mega Drain. If the first Gengar lands it twice, the fight is over. However, for Omastar, we can set up double team right away and minimize the probability of it landing. After I've got my full six turns of setup off, I begin to attack with Surf. Double Team does what it was intended for, and helps Omastar defeat Agatha without any issues. This is why this move is going to be banned going forward. Before Lance, I teach Omastar Blizzard for the dragons. After that, I need to roll the dice a small amount. Double Team needs to allow me to get past Gyarados. This is a tense and largely luck-based fight. After setting up a bit, I can rest up and then finally switch into Surf and take it down. Why Surf, you ask, if Blizzard is neutrally effective? Well, mostly I want to save my PP for the dragons. My first Blizzard against Dragonair misses, so I'm glad I did this in this way. After that, I sweep through the rest of his team and take my victory over the league. Omastar completes the Elite Four with a time of 1 hour, 19 minutes, and 45 seconds. Kabutops is starting the league with a 5 minute and 57 second lead. That's pretty significant, but because of the time that Omastar just made through the league, Kabutops will lose time if it has to do any of the fights twice. Lorelei opens with Dugong, and again this is an opportunity to set up. Unfortunately, right after I knock it out, I level up and reset my badge boost increases. Oh well, even without the badge boost glitch, I can body slam my way through all of her Pokemon and defeat her on my first attempt. So I'm just going to quickly suggest that some of these moves get renamed. I think that Body Slam should now be called Scythe Attack, and that Sword Stance should be called I've Got Scythes for Hands, Be Scared. Bruno is easy, right? Well, sort of. I set up on the first Onyx while it receives X Defense. After that, I switch into Surf and sweep his initial Pokemon. I had intended to switch back into Body Slam from a Champ, but I spammed a bit too much and used Surf on it first turn. It can use Submission and do a lot of damage, but I survived the hit and Kabutops knocks it out. By the way, I heard everyone in the comments, I am now spamming B instead of spamming A. Agatha is the fight where all of this could fall apart. Kabutops is using an incredibly powerful strategy, but I think Omastar's strategy is likely to be more consistent against Agatha. Gengar is first, things don't go well and then she switches into Golbat. Against Golbat or Arbok, I can set up and then heal. Gengar comes back out and it gets Substitute off, and then two hits the Dark Lord with Mega Drain. On my second attempt, I get a bit lucky with Gengar using Substitute when it's on too low health. This causes it to fail. I've made it past the hardest part of the fight now. I set up and heal against the Golbat before she switches it out for Haunter. Then things get very bad. I guess that wasn't the hardest part of the fight. Haunter puts me to sleep and uses two consecutive Dream Eaters, taking me down to orange health. 
When I wake up, I have to make a choice, attack or heal. I choose to attack, and two turns later, I pass the Haunter with 32 hit points remaining. Golbat comes back out and gives me an opportunity to heal up. Arbok isn't an issue, but the last Gengar could be. It uses Psychic first turn and does a lot of damage. Then it fails a Dream Eater, and the turn after that it uses another Psychic. I thought that this was it, but the Dark Lord himself hangs on with 15 hit points and knocks the Gengar out. I'm glad I'm moving on from her after only two attempts. Lance is next. I set up one sword stance for Gyarados, and then it knocks Kabutops out immediately. On the second fight, I'm able to make it past the Gyarados, and then set up on the second Dragonair. Honestly, I think I should have just knocked both of them out and set up on Aerodactyl, because its moveset and my resistances make that more consistent. I also wouldn't have had my speed lowered by Bubble Beam in that scenario. This lower speed allows Dragonite to move first against me and use Thunder, but it misses. If that didn't happen, I think I would have just adjusted and set up on the Aerodactyl, and then got through the fight on the next attempt anyways. Kabutops finishes the league at 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 15 seconds. So Omastar did gain a bit of ground here, but the Dark Lord still has an incredible 5.5 minute lead. Back to Lord Helix for the final battle in our second playthrough. Are you tired yet? I am. My voice is too. I'm on my second day of recording now, and you might have heard earlier in the script that my voice got pretty shot at the end of the first day. Anyways, let's continue. Omastar knocks Sandslash out right away with Surf. Next, I make the tough call and set up on Alakazam. It outspeeds and lands a huge critical hit on me first turn. After using a couple instances of double team, I switch into rest to heal. After setting up the remaining double teams, I knock it out over two turns with Blizzard and then Surf. Executor is an easy one shot with Blizzard. No leech seeds this time. Cloister is next. This clamping shell really made my previous runs hard, but this time it can't hit me and two turns later Omastar is moving on. Once I knock out Ninetales, I level up, which resets my badge boost, at the worst possible time, right before Jolteon. I hit it with Surf, and it does less than half damage. It takes me two more turns to knock it out and complete the fight. Honestly, that would have been impossible at this level without Double Team. It might have been dirty, and we might all hate it, but it was Omastar's only way. Sometimes when you're a meme, you have to play dirty to win. Omastar finishes the game with a time of 1 hour, 21 minutes, and 34 seconds. With Kabutops, I estimated that I'm going to be able to knock out Sandslash and Alakazam in a single hit and set up on Executor. I'm correct on Sandslash, but Alakazam outspeeds and hits Psychic. After that, my Body Slam doesn't knock it out. Please, not another Psychic. It uses something much worse. Kinesis. Luckily, I do land my next Body Slam and knock it out. At Executor, I set up and then heal. It's going to just spam Leech Seed here. There's nothing that I can do about that. When I finally knock it out, I miss two Body Slams in a row. My PP actually might be the limiting factor here. I miss once against Cloyster, but I manage to knock it out. At Ninetales, I realize that I only have two attempts with Body Slam left. Because I'm fighting with lowered accuracy, I want both of these PP for Jolteon. Using Surf against Ninetales is so stressful. I get confused, hit myself, and due to setup, it does massive damage. If I hit myself again, this is over. Luckily, Kabutops focuses and uses rest so that the fight continues. This scenario repeats, but this time I heal up when I'm in orange health. I don't want to give this away. Leech Seed is being a huge nuisance here though. It's healed Ninetales almost completely by this point. I finally manage to take it down, and I snap out of confusion the turn that I land the final blow. That's convenient, because it's Jolteon time. I outspeed, and I knock it out with a single body slam. We can now crown the winner of the second playthrough. Kabutops takes it with a time of 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 43 seconds. That's only 4 minutes and 15 seconds faster than Omastar. Overall, the Kabuto line has won both playthroughs. It's clear that the Omanyte line has an advantage against Brock, but much of that advantage fades by the final rival fight and the Elite Four. The factors that lead to it getting a slower time are low attack, low speed, and lack of offensive setup in its move pool. 
Kabutops, on the other hand, has low special and a lack of stab moves that utilize its attack stat, but access to Slash, Swords Dance, and Body Slam remedy this ailment. It is truly a Pokemon to be feared. It deserves the title, Dark Lord. It's got scythes for hands after all. So I actually stopped filming footage here. I figured that I had determined that Kabutops was faster and more reliable. However, then I got thinking. I gave Omastar double team to level the playing field, but what would happen if Kabutops had it as well? But because I'm adding a new powerful move to Kabutops now, I think that Omastar also needs something else. So this time it's going to be able to utilize the badge boost glitch with Withdraw. This is probably going to be the only time on my channel that I get this dirty, so enjoy it while it lasts. Also, I filmed this run more recently, so I'm putting more of my current knowledge to work here. This run is going to be absolutely wild. In the Brock split, I'm able to shave off 2 minutes and 12 seconds from Omastar's time. Better rooting, skipping useless items, and less overall wild encounters are the reasons that I was able to do this. I think I could repeat this if I came back and tried it again. For the Misty split, I become more efficient, and I find a way to skip more heals. After finishing Nugget Bridge, I then use Dig Routing to obtain Body Slam with minimum walking around. This lets me beat her with a time that's 4 minutes and 23 seconds faster than the last run. That's another big improvement. Surge is next, and despite Omastar having 69 hit points, Thunderbolt knocks it out. But Surge only has one Pokemon, and this makes him mostly about luck. On my second attempt, I get a lucky critical hit on the first turn with Bubble Beam, and with that I'm able to defeat him. In the Celadon portion of the game is where I change the most. This time I'm going to put Double Team to work as soon as possible, and additionally I'm going to use the Pokedoll to skip the Rocket Hideout and the Marowak. The more I think about this one, the more I like the idea of skipping the hideout. It saves me production time, it forces the Pokemon to proceed at a lower level, and it punishes Pokemon who are attempting to buy Hyper Beam or Substitute. These TMs are incredible, and there are a few high priced items that you can find in the hideout and then sell later to help with buying coins. Because those moves are so powerful, I think that Pokemon should pay a price in time to be able to obtain them. Going forward, I'll be using the Pokedoll to skip the hideout. Just know that every run on my channel until this point includes the hideout time. After completing the tower, I head directly towards Fuchsia. This is the same as the last Omastar playthrough. I'm skipping Erika and prioritizing getting Surf and Double Team. After all that's done, I head to Sylph and then battle the rival. In this fight, I need to use the power of Double Team. It's going to allow Omastar to get through this at a low level without having to train. I set up on the Sand Slash because it can't do much damage to us. And then after fully setting up, and I do mean fully, 6 double teams and 6 withdraws, I begin the snail paced sweep. Since this battle is actually quite slow, you might ask, are you actually saving time here? Well, the time I'm saving is not during the battle, it's all the time that I would need to spend leveling up, fighting other trainers, and that sort of thing. Because of Omastar's high special and defense, I can actually just tank the occasional hit that makes it through the double team. So this strategy is now completely consistent. It's time for Erika. This is the hardest spot in this run. I begin and I set up double team, but Tangela is just doing too much damage. This is scary. I manage to get off six double teams without it hitting me, and then I begin to use Ice Beam. Tangela faints. Weepin Bell is next, and Ice Beam knocks it out. Finally, Gloom comes out, and Omastar does it. Erika is no more. I'm three minutes and 22 seconds ahead of my previous run. Koga is absolutely terrifying. The first Venonat gets Omastar down to low health, and I mean low health, 6 hit points. But the meme itself is determined. It finishes setting up, and with that it's ready to start attacking Koga's team. But it's going at snail's pace here against his bug poison Pokemon. The stress from this fight probably shaved a few years off my life, and it also shaved 9 minutes and 20 seconds off of my previous run time. Blaine isn't worth talking about. Omastar is never going to have a problem here just due to its typing. I'm getting even further ahead of my old time now. So these battles are slow slugfests, well uh, slow snail fests actually, but Omastar is speeding through the game at a breakneck speed. It's like this thing has shell smash in the overworld or something. Sabrina is next. Here I fully set up against the Abra. This fight is likely going to be slow, so I can at least try to make it consistent. 
I avoid so many turns of flash and it feels so good. After all 12 turns of setup, I use Surf and knock the Abra out. Kadabra misses Psychic, but Surf doesn't knock it out. It tries again and this time Psychic hits Omastar and does massive damage due to a critical hit. I knock it out with Surf and then her ace Alakazam is last. It just avoids attacking and tries to set up its defense while Omastar slowly freezes it to death with Ice Beam. Giovanni is last and I set up fully here. After that, the snail can begin its sweep through the rest of his team. The final rival fight is the reason I designed this double team strategy, and it's the whole reason we're in this cheesy mess in the first place. It's because I couldn't get past the Jolteon in the previous race that I ever even considered using this move with Omastar. It's honestly so cheesy right now at this point in the video that you'd think there's a mill tank around somewhere, but there aren't any of those in Kanto. The thing about this strategy that is so great is that it makes the Elite Four trivial. Omastar originally struggled with them due to its poor typing and low speed, but now it can take its time and slowly make it through all of them. In my brain, something happened when I was watching this. I just started to realize how badly Kabutops was about to get defeated. Because this was the third playthrough, and I never intended to do it, I was just playing through this one all in one big attempt. I honestly thought I'd just summarize this playthrough at the end of the video in like four sentences. But now Omastar has posted a really good competitive time. Is Kabutops going to suffer a terrible defeat in this final third playthrough? If it does, what does that mean? Does it now lose the bragging rights that it earned over the previous two races? The odds are stacked against this scythe-handed trilobite, because the fastest time it's achieved yet is 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 43 seconds. And I'm going to have to improve this time to be competitive with Omastar's newest finish, which is 1 hour, 5 minutes, and 39 seconds. So, let's find out if Double Team can help Kabutops beat this incredibly fast time. In this playthrough, I determined that I could get past Brock faster than before. I'm able to cut out an optional trainer and a few items. I also get good luck against the optional rival battle, and he doesn't delay me as much as he could. Usually he can just like lower my attack over and over until Kabutops is dealing no damage, and then Eevee sets up sand attack over and over, but this time I get through that fight without delaying too much. Brock's Onyx then faints, and I'm 2 minutes faster than my previous time, but I'm still slower than Omastar was. Because I just played my Beedrill vs Butterfree follow up video, the powerful TMs from the game corner are on my mind. I think that Kabutops would do very well if it had access to Hyper Beam. It might allow it to skip turns of setup in most major battles, which could make them both faster and more consistent. This is the strategy that I set out to play out in this playthrough. I want to grab every high priced item that I can as I move through the game. Despite paying the time price of grabbing extra items, I'm able to actually clock in faster after defeating Erika. Against Koga, I'm starting to figure out that Kabutops needs to use double team differently than Omastar. Lower defensive stats mean that one or two double teams followed by Swords Dance is the best choice. If you take forever setting up for 9 turns, the occasional stray hit that comes through really does a lot of damage to Kabutops and makes the fights way less consistent. Instead, just raising my evasion slightly can give me the lead that I need in order to sweep. With that said, there are still times that a full double team setup makes sense, like against Sabrina. The Abra provides me the opportunity that I need in order to get very safe. Here I can skip Swords Dance altogether and just use Slash instead. She likes to use Reflect and X Defend on Alakazam, and this will completely negate those stat alterations. Kabutops uses his scythes to slash and takes out the powerful psychic Pokemon. Now things get interesting. I have the choice to either train in Blaine's gym or finish him off and move on at a low level. This was a tough call, but in the end, I don't think that Kabutops is making good enough time to train anymore. Additionally, I'm not going to have the time that I need in order to buy Hyper Beam. Going out of my way for that long in the game corner is going to result in a loss now. I need to push forward and get scrappy with my level and my moveset that I have right now. Giovanni is next. I set up some double teams against Dugtrio, then I knock it out and use Swords Dance against Persian. It's a normal type so I feel safe setting up here. I probably should have just knocked the Dugtrio out right away. Nidoqueen comes out next, and my Body Slam doesn't knock it out. It lands Thunder despite my double team setup, and Kabutops becomes paralyzed. A few turns later, I faint. On my second attempt, I adjust. Surf for Dugtrio and set up on Persian. 
Once Kabutops is satisfied with the amount he's danced, I unleash on the Nidos. I knock them both out with ease. And this time, I didn't avoid Surf, so I'm able to take care of Rhydon without any worries. The final rival requires double team setup at this level. Without it, Jolteon will outspeed and one-hit Kabutops. But with it, his Thunder basically has negative accuracy. If it could damage him, it would. Kabutops comes in with a pre-league time of 57 minutes and 22 seconds. It's actually managed to take away Omastar's lead again. Only 2 minutes and 26 seconds separate them though, so this race is really close. Lorelei should be easy because of how Dugong's AI works. And then this happens. It spams Bubble Beam and knocks Kabutops out. So that's some wasted time. Honestly, it almost always uses Rest second turn. On the next fight, things go slightly closer to the original plan. I'm able to get set up, but Kabutops only has 28 hit points left. One stray attack and I'll faint. Cloister goes down. Slowbro survives because of how low level I am, and it uses Withdraw, and then faints. Jinx outspeeds, but Double Team does its job. Her ace Lapras is last. It outspeeds with Hydro Pump, but it misses. Body Slam takes it down to red health, and then it misses again. Kabutops is moving on to Agatha. A Agatha's next, right? Double Team against her is so important. This is going to allow Kabutops to get past Mega Drain without pure luck. Surf isn't doing much damage, but because I have such high evasion, I can take my time and eventually defeat her. I'm past the hour mark now, and I think it's still possible for Kabutops to pull this out of the hat. Lance is challenging. The only thing that I can do here is hope that Double Team will allow me to survive the Gyarados fight. On my first attempt, it lands two Hydro Pumps early on, and Kabutops faints. Okay, second fight. This time I only set up three double teams, and then I knock the Gyarados out. The Dragonairs are actually significantly less scary, so I finish my setup here. Aerodactyl is next, and luckily this time its flying moves can hardly do anything to Kabutops. Surf does good damage, and then I knock it out. Dragonite is last. Body Slam takes it down to red health, and it uses Thunder, but it's a miss. Kabutops lands the final hit, and I'm moving on to the champion, with just over 3 minutes of time left. He opens with Sandslash, and I begin to set up Double Team. I stop after 3 and knock the Sandslash out. I don't want a rogue Earthquake hitting me. Alakazam follows, and Double Team prevents its first attack. This is great, because I need 2 turns to knock it out with Body Slam. Luckily, Executor, who has a 125 base special, doesn't know Solar Beam, so I finish my setup here. With Kabutops fully powered up, there's only one question left. Will Jolteon land its attack and knock me out? If I lose, I think I've only got one attempt's worth of time left, maybe two if I'm very fast. Jolteon comes out. It outspeeds and uses Thunder. But it misses, and Kabutops knocks it out. It gets a time of 1 hour, 3 minutes, and 30 seconds. So even when Omastar pulls out double team and the badge boost tactics, Kabutops can still get it done faster and at a lower level. I think we can now declare our winner. It's the dancing, scythe-handed trilobite, who is only a few clicks away from being a meme god. From now on, I pledge to only choose the dome fossil and forever renounce Lord Helix. By the way, no victory high fives for you, Omastar, but we still love you. Despite the runtime of this video, there is still one stone left unturned. What about league times when these Pokemon aren't allowed to save? I completed these before the third playthrough, but I do think they're instructive. I did ban Double Team for these consistent league runs to see what both of these Pokemon could do without it. Obviously Omastar and Kabutops will have a great time with it, we've already proven that. But what about without it? Just a quick note before we dive into these J Rose 11 style league playthroughs. Note that the timer in the top left is recording the total league time, not the time that the Pokemon played through the game at. That would be impossible. To make this happen, Kabutops needs to start the league at level 65. The number one threat is Lance's Gyarados. Hydro Pump is just far too devastating at a lower level. However, arriving at Lance at level 67, I can now just use one Swords Dance and then tank a Hydro Pump, if he actually landed one, and then knock the Gyarados out. From there, I can knock both the Dragonair out and finish setting up on Aerodactyl. Dragonite comes out, and I get an unfortunate critical hit, but at this level, I tank its attack well and finish it off the next turn. The champion is last. 
Kabutops can knock both Sandslash and Alakazam out immediately without setup. That allows me to set up on the Executor, as it tries to spam Leech Seed. After that's out of the way, all I have to do is spam Body Slam. With Omastar, things are worse. Jolteon is the barrier. The prehistoric snail can make it all the way to him, but it just outspeeds and knocks us out right away. I've used all my rare candies, and even with that I can't make it by him. I spend time training and grabbing a final rare candy from the power plant before attempting the league again. Now I'm level 71 during the champion fight. The most annoying Pokemon here is Cloyster. Look at it! Clamp just keeps ruining my day! Finally I get to Ninetales and manage to knock it out. Finally I'm moving on to his ace, and even at this level Jolteon still outspeeds Omastar with Thunder and takes us all the way down to 8 hit points. I then miss my Blizzard, and I thought that that was it. But then Jolteon uses Thunder Wave, and Omastar lands Blizzard, which knocks the Electric Doggo out. So this wasn't consistent, but I did manage to win with Omastar. Kabutops, however, gets the faster time in 3 races, and in the consistent league attempt. It also gets the lowest level finish in two of the three races, and the lowest level finish in the consistent league. So, I do think that it's completely fair to say that it's the winner. Congratulations, Kabutops. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching this beast. It's my dream to be doing this channel full time, and you can help me out through doing the various YouTube things. So, like, subscribe, ring the Chimeco for more, comment, and share with a friend. If you also want to directly support me, you can join my Patreon. No matter how much you pledge, you'll be included in this cool credit sequence at the end of every one of my videos. I'm currently collecting the original 151 patrons, and you could be one of them. But money isn't everything. In fact, the most important thing is that you're just here watching. Thanks so much. You're incredible, and I'll see you in my next video.